Let's get into our topic of the day. Um, your yeah. latest ebook. Let's talk about that topic and the title. Oh yes, the title of this ebook is "Who's Playing Jesus Games." Ah, wonderful! You always come up with the most incisive uh, titles. That I, I always makes people perk up and you say, "What? What kind of question is that?" Uh, tell me uh, where uh, where this is coming from. Well, um, uh, I'm in touch with uh, a lot of people. Uh, contact me almost incessantly with uh, stories about uh, this Jesus person who never existed, or if he did exist, um, he was only a man. Um, and the stories that Christianity has built up about him were built up later and made him into a god when really uh, the people who knew him, if he existed, uh, never considered him to be anything more than just a good man. But that's basically the argument that uh, are filling the Internet and newspapers around Christmas time and uh, it seems to be that every Christmas, every Easter, just before these events, uh, we get these, this big uh, swath of uh, objections uh, about this Jesus Christ, uh, the most important figure or the most famous figure in history. So this book came out ostensibly to look at these objections, uh, run, through, run them through the mill, and see what the truth really is. Why don't you do that? Let's go through them systematically, because we know that the Bible, uh, through the Old Testament, pointed forward to the coming of Messiah, Mashiach. Many of the Jews now are still waiting for the coming of a Messiah, uh, but they don't really understand he already came. Can you go through some of yeah. the analysis of these of these issues? Okay. Now, uh, the, the first the first one that was given to me that was thrown at me only only three days ago. Again, that it keeps coming up. It's almost a, a tired objection because it's it dies, then it's resurrected again, um, that there's no historical mention of Jesus outside the Gospels, outside the New Testament. And that is believed by a lot of intelligent people, Dr. Bill, that nobody for the first few centuries, when Christianity was upturning society and, and so much uh, revolution was taking place in the lives of people, which was against the established view because Christianity was something quite different from, from what the religions and the politics of the world was playing back there, that all those early centuries we don't have one record of anyone disputing or questioning the, his historical existence. It was taken as an axiom that he did exist. So uh, right now we're coming up with objections 2,000 years later that he didn't exist. We have evidence from his enemies uh, and those who had no interest in promoting his, his uh, cause at all. Uh, we have Roman uh, records coming to light. We have Jewish records coming to light. And we have um, independents coming to light who, who were neither Jewish nor Roman. Uh, for example, um, there was a historian uh, he lived in the middle of the uh, the first century, born around about 52 AD. And um, he was a Roman senator, a consul. He was a governor of Britain for quite a number of years, and he served as governor of, of Roman provinces in around Turkey. And he was one of the greatest historians of ancient Rome. His name was Cornelius Tacitus. And he wrote a 16-volume uh, a history of Roman emperors. He called it uh, The Annals. Ah. Now, I hear the bumper music. We'll be back in a moment as you continue that thought. Stay tuned, everyone. We'll be back in a moment with Jonathan Gray. Amazing analysis coming up. Welcome back, and Jonathan Gray, please continue with that analysis of the uh, uh, early Roman historian of the first century. Uh, yes, Bill. Um, he, this historian, uh, Tacitus, actually uh, is 
uh, if you go to the uh, in, uh, Wikipedia on the internet, uh, they'll make a statement such as something like this. Tacitus was a scrupulous historian who paid careful attention to the historical works. Now, we can trust this man and know that what he's saying was well, very well researched as a Roman. Now, he, he talks about the burning of Rome, and he states that the followers of Jesus Christ were blamed. Now, that was in AD 64. Uh, he says that uh, to silence the rumour that Nero had been involved in the burning of Rome, he tortured and made false accusations against those who were hated for their abominations. They were called Christians by the populace. And then he says that Christus, from whom the name had come, suffered the extreme penalty, crucifixion, during the reign of Tiberius under the hand of their procurator. Pontius Pilate. So there's no mistake in who he's talking about here, Bill. Now, these same historians talk about Julius Caesar. Now, we do not dispute the existence of Julius Caesar. No one does. Yet the same critic will, who uh, accepts the historicity of, of Julius Caesar and others on much less evidence will often merely uh, accept it on the appearance of his name once in history Yet he's willing to reject Jesus, mentioned hundreds of times. Uh, I don't look upon that as being an honest uh, approach to the subject at all. Exactly. And, of course, even down just a few years ago in Caesarea, the Jewish archaeologist with no agenda found further stones with the names uh, and specific references to Jesus and to Pontius Pilate uh, right there down in Caesarea with the, the port built by uh, King Herod Agrippa. Yeah, that's right. And... Uh, Archaeology, uh, to this day, I can state this without any fear of contradiction, archaeology has never yet, in all its discoveries, been able to controvert a single Bible reference and prove it wrong. Isn't that amazing? There's no book like that in history, not even, quote, a academic book. Not at all, no, that's right. Yeah. And... Uh, Coming a little further into this, okay, it, it's easy enough to knock this, uh, this no-history uh, man uh, charge, but uh, I, I won't spend too much time on that. We've got lots. I should say this, that I've documented uh, about a dozen ancient contemporary reports of Jesus from various sources, and they're very, very fascinating. Some of them go into quite de detail about him. Right. But perhaps we could move on to this. Um, there are critics who recognize Jesus' historicity, but they say, look, he was only a man, um, and he was worshipped by people a little later, and eventually they turned him into a god. And this took several hundred years uh, for this to occur. And they zero in on Constantine, the Roman emperor, as an example, and that, of course, makes it sound very, very official, very, very genuine. Um, you mention a man from the past and use him uh, as an example of he invented it, he invented the Jesus God idea, and okay, people who have not done their research will say, well, this man had must have his facts. He's told us exactly when it happened. Right. Okay. So, so, uh, yeah. so we, we could perhaps delve for a few minutes into this Constantine idea because it's, it's surfacing, Dr. Bill, apparently more and more. Uh, people... Right, it seems, copying one another like sheep, following along, not checking their sources, but simply quoting another writer. And that's not good scholarship. The charge actually is this, that the writings were, were changed and uh, a list, the list of books was decided by Constantine's men in the 4th century. Now, I'd, I'd like to state this, that uh, way back in the 1st century, the same list of books was already known and accepted throughout the Christian world. The same 27 New Testament books we have today. And that can be established without much difficulty. And later on, when church councils came into play in, in the 4th century onwards, far from giving any authority to the books, they rather bowed to their authority. They did not decide what books had to go in. They simply acknowledged the books that had already been accepted from the 1st century. Right. Now, th there was already a very early unity of belief concerning which were the inspired books. And now Christians both in the Eastern world and in the Western world were in agreement on this. Now, if Constantine had decided 
Now, let me put it this way, that we've got uh, almost 6,000 surviving Greek New Testament manuscripts that have been discovered. And these not only contain the same identical books, but the Gospels even show the same titles in all of them. Now, for that to be possible over the scattered area of the world, now, they didn't have telephones and faxes and radio and Internet to unify what they were holding in their hands. So something had to have been unified before it went out to the whole world, if you know what I mean. Right. And by the time Constantine came along, four centuries later, or three centuries later, uh, he would have a pretty hard job suddenly deciding we're going to put these books in the Bible and let the whole world accept them. So, Because what are you going to do with all the books that are already out, that are in agreement yeah, yeah, with each other? Yeah, There'll soon be found a discrepancy. Right. He, he would have no way of changing Jesus into a God later 